Thank you. And uh, first of all, we'd like to uh, I'd ask Kay if, I'd ask Kay if we're in compliance with the open meeting law. We are in compliance. And thank you all for being here. And we thought the best uh, way was to get everyone from each board uh, here at the same time to hear the same uh, same answers to the questions you might want to ask, so we know each know what uh, what the ideas coming forward were. And no matter what happens tonight uh, and in the future for combined dispatch, I like to point out a few things where that we have had a very good success in the last few years. We've had um, Bernie Romer as our, our joint purchasing agent, uh, and we each, the city and the county, pay 50% of his salaries, and that's worked out very well. Some of the scales of economy have been passed on to the other municipalities in the county. The county highway department and the city DPW have worked well, exchange equipment and different uh, things they're able to do for each other. And as we were driving here, I'm saw you, sure you all noticed uh, the harbor cleanup that's going forward. That was uh, largely due to the, uh, the shared services and the uh, cooperation between the city, the county, and a lot of other uh, departments and, uh, and different agencies throughout the uh, state and federal government. And another would be the economic development that we're working together and we're both funding. And uh, I think those are a few of the things that are working well that we've had some shared services. And um, tonight uh, we'll see if we can share some more services and pass on the savings to the uh, taxpayers. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mayor Van Akron for some comments. Thank you. It's great to see everybody here tonight. Uh, this has been long talked about. Um, I think it's time that we got together as a group with the county board and the city officials to uh, see all the proposals up front. Let's talk about them openly. Let's answer any questions that anybody has from the audience after the presentations. And um, looking forward to moving forward. You know, the county and city has been working very well together the last few years. Uh, Roger forgot to mention the clinic that is, is a joint venture between us and them in saving health care costs for both city employees and county employees and now the school systems joining in on that. Um, we should be continuing to do that and look for any savings we can when it comes to joint services and saving monies for the taxpayers. We both ser serve the same taxpayers in this community uh, and for us to continue to go forward we need that kind of relationship between our police department and our sheriff's department between our fire departments and the other fire departments and between our boards and their and the county boards so i'm looking forward to uh tonight's presentation and any questions that may have you from you um, again thank you for spending time with us and it's pretty unprecedented that the county board and city council get together um, but i think it's pretty impressive that we do it thank you now i'd like to turn it over to um Council President Don Hammond for some opening remarks. Um, I'll keep mine relatively brief. Um, first off, I'd, I'd echo the comments of uh, uh, Mayor Van Akron and County Board Chair uh, Testrodi, but I also would like to thank some of the people that got us to this point. I remember last October I made a phone call to Adam and said, hey, can we have lunch? And uh, that was kind of the beginning of this uh, process, which I believe is experienced over 40 years of, of conversation. Um, we met, created a small little subcommittee, um, Inspector Bruckbauer and many from his team, our team, and um, although the debate has been spirited at times, um, we were all moving towards the same direction, and for that I really thank the entire group that was involved with this. Many meetings, many, uh, um, again, conversations, um, but it brought us to this point where we have um, at least some options. And I think we're a lot closer now than maybe ever before um, to having a combined dispatch realized. So I would like to thank, uh, again, that group. Thank everybody for attending. Um, and again, look forward to having uh, an open and honest discussion about this. So thank you. I'd 
I'd like to turn it over to the uh, Sheriff's Department to make some comments. Thanks, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'd like to just uh, share uh, uh, a little something with you. We've been working on this uh, collectively for quite a while. And um, a lot of time, effort, consideration had been put into it. And it was, it's been a great working relationship. Um, I have came out of our discussions feeling pretty strongly about a direction we should and that was based on working with the city, city representatives, the police department, our local, our, our county government, along with our, our officers, certainly with Inspector Bill Blockflower, that's been involved in this process for many, many times. And I guess I'm going to come out and I'm strongly going to support that we go with combined dispatch for the very reasons that you're going to be hearing tonight. You're going to hear some of the reasons multiple times, and they're valid reasons. The avenue that I personally support and that had been discussed in our small groups was that we would house it at the county and supervised by the county. Okay? The reason why I support that, that route is for several various reasons. The number one reason that we need to go to combine the idea that if we are going to be in the county, if we're going to be the ones to manage it, supervise it, in-house is the way to go. Supervision is the number one thing that we need in our dispatch centers at both locations, the city and the county. We have taken a step to put supervision in. We have Sergeant Christy DeBlay, who has made efforts in our dispatch center that only proves and validates why we need to have combined dispatch. The efficiency and effectiveness that has occurred because of her leadership and her supervision in that comm center has made a huge difference. And I can only imagine that when we combine the two services together with the adequate supervision that both houses need and deserve, citizens of Sheboygan County are going to reap the benefits. Now the reason why I support it at the Sheriff's Department, whether it's a remodeling the first floor or adding on, it does not matter to me, it comes down to logistics. Communication is a hurdle in a law enforcement agency that is 24-7. It's difficult to write. Now add, with the Sheriff's Department, we already have two campuses. And I realize this is similar with the Fire Department with multiple stations. There are some, log some logistics involved that make it very difficult for communication. To house a dispatch center within one of our campuses would be ideal because we are talking about the integral part of law enforcement. And that's our comm center. It is a key component to law enforcement and EMS services. The effectiveness and efficiency of that comm center being in our house where we're supervising would be advantageous to us to provide the greatest efficiency and effectiveness. Okay. Um, I also strongly believe that what we, being over at the county, we have the opportunity to expand in the future. I think it's wise to invest the money off the get-go into a location where we can expand thinking forward, thinking into the future, and being prepared for that versus a, a kind of like a short time fix. I think we need to look into the future, have adequate space for councils that are going to be needed and office spaces for the supervisors and managers. Okay. Uh, the other component, um, the model that we're following is pretty much the model that has been throughout the state, and that is it's going to the county. I am not aware, unless somebody knows of otherwise, that it hasn't been at the state. Okay? This is my position, this is my state. This is just how I feel. Where we end up, well, that's yet to be determined. I am supportive of a combined dispatch center, and I hope that we can find common ground to best serve the citizens of Sheboygan County. And I know we'll get there. I'm confident. 
So I just wanted to share that with you. You're going to hear now from representatives that are going to articulate in more detail why we need a combined dispatch. And I know several of you have heard it before. However, it's going to be said again because it is the very reason why we need a dispatch a combined dispatch to pay our value. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Jim. That has yes. Okay. I'm going to have uh, Lieutenant Jim Rissou give a PowerPoint presentation that will help with a little bit more details of why we want to go to a combined dispatch center, the benefits of it. And I'll turn it over to, uh, turn it over to Captain Wallace. Thank you, Sheriff. This presentation was put together a few months ago uh, as a means to uh, I guess show some identified benefits operationally to uh, the combined center. And uh, this, those of you that are on law committee uh, have been to that, that uh, meeting or shared services committee have, have seen this presentation previous. Um, but for those of you not, I'll just try to present a, an overview of uh, some of the benefits that have been identified and we're trying to put it all in place. I did add a couple slides since that time based on some recent events that I thought would, would help emphasize some of those, some of those benefits. Here's, these are some of the benefits that have been identified. One is a single point of contact for all county residents. Um, currently, and I believe Chief Herman will demonstrate some of that also, is that when a 911 call uh, by cell phone is received in our county, it goes to uh, our county comment center. And that call then has to, once you determine the um, exact address and the basic nature of a call, that call has to be transferred over to the city um, so that assistance can be, can be sent. This would eliminate that. It would be a one-stop shop for all communications. You wouldn't have to try and figure out uh, you know, where, it, where to call in an emergency situation. You could be able to do that. Uh, the second thing, the standardized training and protocols for all personnel. Uh, being a dispatcher is a profession that requires some extensive training, experience, and development. Uh, being able to do that on a standardized basis so that all personnel have the same training, um, all up to the same standards, and uh, both by their professions, professional standards and also by standards set forth by, by statute. In order to accomplish that, uh, we can have standardized training for all dispatchers in the county. So all dispatchers would have the same, uh, same standards, same protocols. The other thing, the other uh, benefit operationally is that presents a larger, uh, larger pool of employees uh, that we can, be, we can draw on uh, during temporary shortages. Um, as in any workplace, there are temporary shortages due to illness, injury, uh, or other circumstances, sometimes retirements. Uh, we, we typically cannot replace a, an employee until they've actually retired and, and left uh, their employment. And then we have to train another person which takes approximately four to five months to get them back into that position and get that position filled. Uh, during those temporary shortages, we would have a larger group of people to draw on to fill those, to fill those vacancies and you know, to cover those shifts. So that would be a, a benefit that we currently uh, struggle with. We'll get more into this in a little bit, but the ability to handle large-scale incidents uh, anywhere in the county based on uh, more personnel and workstations in one location. Having a combined center, um, just as an example, with four, four operating consoles, with four dispatchers working, uh, suddenly a major incident occurs out in front of a traffic crash, uh, I-43 or something like that. Um, we have the ability with a combined center to shift personnel from one side to the other uh, to better accommodate the needs uh, on that side of the comm center. Uh, we currently uh, struggle with that because during a major incident, Still, in the county, we only have uh, two, maybe three operational consoles to, to operate from. And we can bring in other people, we can call other people in to work, but we still have no, no workstations for to work from. Having an adequate facility with enough workstations allows us to expand our, our capabilities uh, on a moment's notice. In the short term and long term, we are able to expand our capabilities to accommodate those, those short term needs. The other benefit is a single location. 
uh, would allow for the remaining center uh, to be used as a true backup center for large-scale emergencies or in the event uh, the primary center is disabled. Uh, I'll cover this more on a couple other slides, but you know, recently, in the, in the past week, there have been two uh, jurisdictions in Wisconsin that have had their, their sheriff's department and comm centers closed and temporarily evacuated due to uh, circumstances we under control. Although it was temporary, uh, those, those incidents can occur. Uh, in those cases, their services had to be transferred to another, to another jurisdiction temporarily. Having a true backup center uh, across town is a benefit that we can move into that center and resume operations almost seamlessly. Uh, we can also accommodate a larger incident by, uh, if it looks like it's going to be a long-term incident, we can dedicate personnel to that, that, that backup center and they can manage that incident from that emergency operations center for a long period of time without hampering the other operations and other uh, functions of the primary center. This is one of the uh, recent events I, uh, I was referring to uh, last week, although it was very temporary. Uh, Kenosha County Sheriff's Office had to be evacuated due to a gas leak. Some landscapers outside the building uh, ripped the gas line, and uh, the whole center had to be shut down temporarily. And I'm imagining that they, they couldn't wait to, to evacuate either this type of circumstance. So that's just one, one event, one short-term event where the uh, entire Sheriff's Department had to be evacuated short-term notice operations. Another one occurred yesterday uh, in Milwaukee County, although I still haven't heard what the uh, what the cause of the outage was, but their entire uh, phone system, phone network, non-emergency and 911, uh, was disabled. Uh, it was disabled sometime around 7 o'clock last night, and I think it came back sometime this morning. Um, but with that large of a jurisdiction, that, that's a major impact. We had to transfer their operations over to um, the emergency operations in Waukesha County, including transferring some of their um, dispatch personnel to manage those calls. Um, I'm assuming it was probably some type of technical uh, malfunction. I haven't heard anything otherwise, but those things can occur. Can occur. Um, we depend largely on technology, uh, fiber optic cables, um, other types of components that can occasionally fail. And in the case of Kenosha County with the gas line. Um, there's utility construction going on uh, in many areas and that those things can happen. It wasn't that long ago that a fiber optic cable in front of our sheriff's department was, was cut um, accidentally by, by some utility construction as well. And that caused some temporary outages. So those short-term things can happen with that backup center. We can, we can resume operations. We've talked about larger incidents. Uh, we have traffic crashes anywhere in the county. I-43 uh, presents particularly uh, large problems just due to the volume of traffic um, that is altered uh, because, of the, because of its location and how it travel that, that road sees every day. Utility outages. Uh, we've had some major utility outages in the past uh, in our county. Uh, power outages in the middle of winter. Uh, there was one circumstance one winter where it was believed that there would not be sufficient uh, natural gas pressure to supply the uh, southern part of our county. And there's a possibility of a intermittent or a short term outage in, in that part of our county. Fortunately, we avoided that, but uh, that circumstance will to present itself in the future again. Weather related situations. Uh, we've been fairly blessed with, with being able to avoid uh, tornadoes uh, that have impacted other areas of the state types of weather related situations but those have occurred in the past so I'll get to some of those as well. Um, fires. Uh, there are still uh, significant fires in our county. We've experienced some of those in the distant past. Uh, Mavis calls. Uh, I'll get into the Mavis a little bit and I think Chief Herman may cover some of that too but um, Mavis is a system that has been developed in the fire service where they are able to utilize the resources of their surrounding uh, jurisdictions better um, meet the demands of a major fire. Um, they were basically, uh, it's, a, it's a preset type uh, program where based on the type of fire that occurs, a fire chief in that jurisdiction uh, can call a certain type of code, a Mavis code, that determines the, the scale of that fire. And based on that call, uh, that one code, the dispatcher is able to 
acquire or dispatch other resources from uh, surrounding areas uh, to assist in that fire. I'll show you what that looks like. NAVA stands for Mutual Aid Box Alarm System. It's a, a preset mutual aid system uh, the fire service is using. Now, this did not print quite as well as I had hoped, but this is a sample of a Mavis car. And this happens to be for the, uh, the town of Mosul, uh, an area I'm kind of familiar with. Uh, it specifically notes this is the, the card that will be pulled for a structure fire. Uh, you see it's a non-hydrant. There's, there's no fire hydrant in that township. So water is an issue. And you see if you go down the list, uh, depending on the, the call that, that that fire chief makes when a structure fire would occur, they would simply go down the list to that category and then dispatch all those resources that are already listed in those jurisdictions surrounding. Uh, it also is a system that is set up not, so that those jurisdictions are not completely depleted uh, so that they can still handle all the service in their area. They simply uh, using pieces of certain resources from a wider area as opposed to just borrowing your neighbor's entire department. So it, it's a great system as far as being able to accommodate on short notice the uh, major, major fire, major operation. This is an example of just a, a, these larger incidents or multiple incidents. Uh, this past spring in March, if you remember, it was an unusually warm and dry uh, spring. It was quite, quite dry that early. Uh, we had a number of grass fires that occurred. Uh, this one was on the Pigeon River uh, along the city and county border. That involved uh, several officers for several hours that were tied up there as well as the fire services uh, in combating that fire. During that fire operation, uh, there was also a grass fire out in the uh, village of Glendula. Um, another officer was diverted uh, there to a, to a different call. And about that same time, there was a second fire not that far away um, in Garden and Racetrack Road out that same area. So there was multiple grass fires, one right after the other. If you can imagine two dispatchers in that car center uh, trying to dispatch and manage resources for all those incidents simultaneously. Uh, it's overwhelming. Uh, having that additional resources available, we could have shifted some resources over uh, to that side of the, that side of the room, I would say, and uh, could have accommodated those, those calls and those, uh, those situations that we can be more efficient with. Another incident in our not too recent, uh, distant past was uh, in September of last year when the ADL co-op uh, caught fire and burned. There were some extensive explosions and things like that. There was concern about hazardous materials that may have been stored in that shed, uh, so we had to evacuate the entire village. Um, that operation was, was quite extensive, involved uh, many jurisdictions from and many uh, different types of emergency services in our county. Um, an incident like that, um, is, is more than two dispatchers can really handle and the combined center would have been able to accommodate that and uh, dispatch resources and, and handle that, manage that call more efficiently. We also remember the landmark fire. It was a large fire in the city of Sheboygan. Again, involved multiple jurisdictions, uh, multiple emergency services in order to manage that, that scene. We were blessed with a pretty mild winter this past winter. We don't remember much about snow this past winter, but uh, the previous winter was not so kind. Uh, this was just an example of a, a three-day snowfall uh, back in January and early February uh, 2011. Um, incidents like that where we have you know, multiple, multiple traffic disruptions, cars in the ditch, an incident like that, incidents like that um, can be overwhelming uh, in the comm center. Again, managing with two people I realize this affects the whole city county, but we've been able to have a larger, um, a larger, a larger center where we could have called in additional, additional personnel and have those additional workstations available. Um, this again would have been managed um, more efficiently and easier on our personnel. Going back a little further, um, the I-43 crash of October 11th, 2002. Uh, I realize it's a little bit far away, but if you look at this this photo itself, you can see multiple jurisdictions. Fire service, there's, there's EMS services, um, there was uh, State Patrol, uh, County, and, uh, City Fire out there. We had a lot of resources in one place. Uh, we also had other non emergency resources like the Salvation Army, 
and other services that we're, we're assisting at that scene. So there's a lot to manage, and we, we're limited by the capacity of that, you know, running that uh, out of one center. And those of you that can remember uh, this far back, um, I barely, barely remember it, but in 1974, the Howard's World Tornado, um, the emergency management director was able to find this portal. I believe it was taken from the parking lot of Town & Country Golf Course. Back then. But that was a that was a major weather-related incident for our area. Uh, significant da damage and some uh, loss of life. We've been blessed with not not having any incidents like that, but we certainly know that uh, tornadoes have impacted other areas of our state. Um, we're certainly not immune to those either. Here's some other um, examples of things that have occurred on Wisconsin. Top two pictures are uh, Barneveld, Wisconsin, Oakfield, Wisconsin. Both experienced uh, you know, major tornadoes. The bottom left is the city of Fond du Lac when they were flooded uh, a few years ago. Uh, the city of Sheboygan has also experienced that, that level of flooding back in 1998. Back in and then the, uh, the bottom right is the uh, Wyawiga train derailment that involved uh, cars uh, carrying propane. Uh, propane is also transported within our county in rail cars. So looking at all these incidents, there's nothing that, that prohibits these incidents from occurring in our jurisdiction as well. And while we may not want to plan um, to be able to address the 100-year you know, incident, the 100-year flood or weather disaster on a daily basis, um, at least we'd like the capacity to be able to uh, manage those, those incidents when they come and be able to ramp up into those, into those uh, incidents. Thank you. Captain Bob Wallace with the Sheboygan Police Department. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank both governmental bodies for, for coming here tonight to, to get good information uh, on the joint uh, dispatch uh, proposal. Um, I would just like to assure everybody on behalf of the Sheboygan Police Department that the Sheboygan Police Department is very committed to the dispatch operation. That, that commitment is not I understand the impact of uh, how the location is that funding for the future inspection. But really what we would like to communicate to everybody tonight is that we support it because we think it's in the best interest of emergency communications in Chihuahua County and delivering good services to the citizens of Chihuahua County and the city of Chihuahua specifically. Uh, the information that Lieutenant Rasu, uh, the Sheriff uh, Preview has provided tonight uh, I think it's right online with the way that we do things. Um, our dispatch centers and our personnel that are assigned to those centers have done a tremendous job over the years. Um, but there are limita there's limitations there. Um, our, our communication center is much like the Sheriff's Department staff by uh, two primary dispatchers at a time. And what that means is that two dispatchers are literally responsible for answer all calls for service from the community, every telephone call that comes in, for police, fire, or EMS. In addition to that, they've got to communicate that uh, information back to the squad cars, dispatch personnel, uh, in some cases dispatch police, fire, and the same incident. And that can become pretty overwhelming and pretty taxing on, on a two-person or maybe three-person communication center at any given time. So we see the uh, proposal for a joint communication center as probably overdue and, uh, and very necessary to position not only the city, but the city and the county and all the EMS and emergency services to best respond to emergencies in the future. We work together in law enforcement with the Sheriff's Department and other law enforcement agencies, police, fire, on a regular basis. So on an operational level, um, you know, we're accustomed to that. We know that, there's, that there would be challenges in, in creating policies and, and procedures and things for a future joint communication center. We're committed to working through that. Uh, we understand that there's a, a, a dispatch manager uh, as part of that proposal. We certainly uh, uh, look forward to working with the dispatch manager in the future to try to uh, plan those protocols and make this happen for the benefit of the community. Uh, the incidents that you pointed out, uh, those are, I, I worked with in some of those cases, and, and very taxing, very, uh, very demanding. And the key to law enforcement, whether in the communication center in the field, is cooperation, situational awareness, uh, teamwork, 
uh, utilizing resources uh, to the you know, best of your ability to answer uh, those emergencies. And I think that by having a joint communication center, both the city and the county would be in a better position to address those types of emergencies in the future. Sometimes even relatively small things require uh, coordination and uh, have extensive demands for police services. And by having a joint communication center, some of that situational awareness and cooperation and teamwork is going to happen not only over the radio, but over the shoulders and through uh, communication right in that communication center. It's going to speed up emergency response. It's going to make the uh, uh, dispatch personnel better able to manage and, uh, and apply the resources where they're needed during the course of the incident. So I know there's, uh, there's uh, you know, a lot of concerns and a lot of um, Things to be worked out yet, but from a, from a purely um, conceptual standpoint, we're very much in favor of a joint dispatch. We want to work together. It's not critical for us whether it's in the uh, current city police facility or in the sheriff's department's facility. Uh, and we understand the details that uh, have to be worked out and how that impacts the larger agreement. But we're very committed to making this work with the government the bodies to uh, put together a program or a package that. on behalf of the 25 fire chiefs and their departments in the county. Uh, oh, sir. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the 25 fire chiefs and fire departments within the county. Um, I think most of the elected officials uh, received the letter of support that was sent out earlier this year. Um, that was a unanimous letter of support from all 25 departments. Um, rather than going through the issues that were in that letter, um, I won't take that time tonight. If any of you have not seen the letter, just uh, let me know and I'll get you a copy of it. Uh, I also received an email from uh, Steve Dickman, who is the head of the division, Mavis Division 113, which is Sheboygan County in the state. Uh, his email um, gave out a couple of issues that uh, combined dispatch would take care of with uh, Mavis events and for those of you that don't know Mavis really has kind of taken the place of mutual aid in the fire service um, Combined dispatch would speed up dispatching resources uh, That go into and out of the city and county It would be easier for dispatch to keep track of all city and county resources on fire scenes if enough dispatchers are in the joint center one dispatcher could be assigned as a Mavis dispatcher during an event and not have to worry about all the other duties that they do now. The way Mavis is set up is that it really needs to have one dispatcher take care of that event as it's going on. And as the other speakers um, talked about, whenever we have a major fire, major incident going on, there's so much going on that you really need to have that dispatcher focused on, on the emergency responders that are at that scene. Uh, anytime that we have a major incident, uh, whether it's fire, law enforcement, when that's over with, we always do a critique of that incident. Uh, after the, the drowning on the North Pier here, we got together. Um, I can't tell you how many organizations were in that room. There had to be 70 people there. And one of the common themes that comes out of all of those um, critiques is that our communi communication could have been better. And, and I think I speak for law enforcement and fire in that that's always a common theme communication needs to get better and what we see with these separate dispatch centers is that um, with the different agencies we're on different frequencies uh, we have a hard time talking to each other uh, it just becomes very difficult to communicate and that's where we see our problems uh, that particular incident on the North Pier um, is a very complex incident in that we had three agencies initially dispatched the Sheboygan Fire Department, Sheboygan Police Department, and the Coast Guard. In addition, um, there was some uh, discrepancy as to whose jurisdiction it really was. The city's uh, jurisdiction goes out 1,700 feet out into the lake. 
very difficult to figure out where that 17 feet is. Is it the city's or is it the county's? Um, so the initial incident commander at that incident was the Sheboygan Fire Department commander. Uh, shortly into that incident, he received a, re a radio communication from the Kohler and Cedar Grove Fire Departments asking where they would like uh, them to locate. Our commander didn't even know that they were responding because that was on a different frequency. He wasn't sure who requested them. Uh, it turned out it was the county dive team, which uh, the Kohler and Cedar Grove Fire Departments are their support teams, which is fine. Uh, we needed them there, but with being on separate frequencies, it causes a lot of uh, communication problems. Another issue on that call is we had actually had rescuers that were swept off their feet off the North Pier and put into peril. Not all of the agencies that were on that call even knew that occurred. So had we needed to go out and do rescue on the rescuers, not everybody was even aware of all that. And I think the part in that call that disturbs me the most is at the time of that 911 call, the Sheboygan Fire Department engine that houses the water rescue equipment was located in the marina parking lot at the base of the North Pier, just finishing up another call. It took nearly seven minutes for that fire engine to become aware of that drowning call. It wasn't because of dispatcher error. It wasn't because of any error by, of any person. It was because the person that took the 911 call was sitting in one dispatch center. The dispatcher that knew where that fire engine was was in another dispatch center. As great as technology is today, face-to-face -to -face is still the best communication. Had those two dispatchers been in the same room, we probably would have gained seven minutes of response time by that fire engine. I know we talked about a lot of the major incidences already. I would actually prefer to talk about the everyday efficiencies that we can gain on the calls that we see every day. The importance that every minute really makes to our emergency responders. The choking call, the fire call, fires double every two minutes. We're seeing in the uh, new lightweight construction, building components are failing in as short as 20 minutes. So every minute that we're there quicker really helps out the responders. The assaults, the robberies, cardiac arrest or medical issues, all of those, every minute really counts for the person that is in need of the help. Biological death occurs roughly eight minutes after sudden cardiac arrest or a person stops breathing. So you can see how every minute is important. The average time for a dispatcher to take a call and get responders on the road is about a minute. The average response time is roughly four minutes. That doesn't leave our emergency medical people much time to save that person's life. This afternoon, I, I spent a lot of time listening to um, some of our 911 calls that were transferred, and I think it's been reported before that the average time to transfer our cell 911 calls now between dispatch centers is roughly 45 seconds to a minute. Um, I would say that that was probably accurate. The ones I listened to, that was all pretty close to that. Um, I'd like to play a tape for you of uh, one of those calls. Uh, it occurred recently, um, and it, you'll be able to hear, actually, the time it took to transfer that. Uh, the first um, voice you'll hear on the tape is from the county dispatcher and then transferring the call over to city. Emergency. Hi, there's just a car accident by the south side ticket safe in Sheboygan. 
Okay, do you know if there's anybody hurt? Uh, I, there's an elderly lady who is bleeding. Okay, I'll get an ambulance right out there. Now, as you heard, this was a pretty routine call, um, not life-threatening. But as you heard, the person had to re repeat twice their call for help. Now, picture yourself in that situation. If you're calling in a life-or-death situation and it's one of your loved ones and you're, you're put on hold and you're asked to repeat your request a second time, how frustrating that can be. And that call there took um, close to a minute to transfer the call over and get people on the road, and then it takes us another minute to get that call dispatched. So that's a very important missing, uh, minute missing that um, the first responders really could use. Uh, I talked about medical emergencies. Um, we have a lot of cardiac events and uh, the doctors have told us in a cardiac event if somebody needs catheterization they need to be in that cath lab within 90 minutes of the onset of that event. Now, most normal people are taking 15 to 20 minutes before they even place that 911 call because everybody's in denial, they're not having the chest pains, whatever the reason, there's usually a delay before we get that 911 call. So we've already lost valuable minutes. The nearest cath lab to the city of Sheboygan is in Ozaki Grafton. So you can see how every minute is important to the Sheboygan Fire Department Ambulance, Orange Cross Ambulance, Plymouth Ambulance, uh, Oostburg, Random Lake, whoever it is, we need every minute we can get. And those, the minutes that we lose transferring calls are really important. The police officers, the firefighters, the medical personnel that respond to emergencies, in these catastrophic events, we're really putting our lives in the hands of the dispatchers. That's why it's so critical when we're having these calls that you have a dedicated dispatcher who's not distracted by other telephone calls, who's listening only to the event that's going on. Really one missed Mayday call, one missed call from, or for help from one of the emergency personnel can actually mean the life, the loss of life of that person. I'm sure uh, the sheriff, the police chief, all the fire chiefs, we all read line of duty death reports almost daily, seeing what we can learn from those reports to prevent them. Again, the common theme you see in almost all the line of duty death reports is communication, lack of communication. We needed better communication. If we had better communication, this may not have happened. Combined dispatch gives us that better communication. We spent a lot of time as our small committee here talking about staffing. I don't know how many meetings we had where we went over what's the right number. We looked at uh, other communities that have done this, Rock County, Waukesha. One of the things they always said was, make sure you have adequate staffing. If you're going to do this, make sure you have adequate staffing when you begin. As I said, we spent much time on this. I believe that we've presented a plan that has adequate staffing to begin with. Uh, the current centers have two dispatchers in each one. We're beginning with four dispatchers in a combined center. I think both sides have admitted that uh, we're lacking in supervision at our dispatch centers. We've also provided for that within this proposal, and it's basically cost neutral. So we have some big gains without any big cost uh, additions. Many of the response issues I've talked about can be fixed, can be improved with combined dispatch. Whether it's that one minute for transferring the call that we gain whether it's that seven minutes that we lost on that drowning call out on the North Pier. The people that we serve cannot afford to lose that time. You never knew, know who it's going to be that needs our, our services and needs that extra minute. It could be somebody in this room tonight. It could be your family, friends, neighbors. You never know when that, when that call is going to come. The police chief, the sheriff, all the fire departments, we've all done our work. Our small committee, we've put this together. Um, I think we've presented a, a very great workable plan. It's now time for these two governmental boards to come together and make this happen. There's no more time for excuses. We've got to get this done now. If we do not, we've failed the people that we're working for. Thank you.
Good evening. Why haven't we been able to get this done? Why can't we get this done? We've been talking about combined dispatch for 30, 40 years. Both the Common Council and the County Board have approved the concept at least a couple times each. Why can't we get this done? I have the task of focusing on a little bit of background here because as decision makers in the room, and I know we have a number of Common Council members and County Board Supervisors, sometimes it's helpful to know where we've been and the painstaking work that's been done for years on this issue to make a decision on how we go forward. And I want to thank Kayla Renz, my assistant. She put together that history that you have in front of you. There's 10 pages of history, and I promise you, not every meeting, communication, action by one committee or, or another, one unit of government or another is in there. She simply took a couple of immense files in our office and tried to summarize them. I am not going to go through every single one of these areas, but I want to point out a few to you because I think it'll help help guide us as we move forward. You know, our, this just goes back to 1999. As you've heard, we've talked about this literally for decades. There's been a lot of discussion over the years, but the last 10 years in particular, I think that discussion got cranked up. And people around the table, and particularly Inspector Brockbauer, I know has been very, very active with these discussions. You'll see that as you go through this, frequently, anytime there's a study or a report or a group commission to get together, more often than not, it is recommending combined dispatch for the very reasons that you heard articulated this morning. And I thought the chief in particular did an excellent job sharing that the focus isn't so much on our employees. It's difficult. They have difficult work. But the key is the people we're serving out there, and we want to make sure that we improve that service. But why isn't getting done? Say one reason it hasn't gotten done is because what we currently have in place is working all right. Some people are satisfied with it. I don't think anybody is in law enforcement, but generally speaking, what we do at the city, what we do at the county, has been working all right with dispatch. There's been a lack of public in interest, a lack of public pressure. How many of you as common council members and county board supervisors have gotten calls from your respective constituents saying, we got to get this done? I'll bet you most of you can count on one hand how many calls you've gotten from your constituents in that regard. You've probably heard from some law enforcement professionals, emergency response professionals, but I think the public at large isn't real engaged with this discussion, and that's too bad. Cost. I think another reason we haven't done this is simply cost and the cost shift that will occur. City taxpayers are paying far more for dispatch services today than rural taxpayers are. And to go to a combined dispatch, it'll create a cost shift, which some people might say there's winners and losers, but in the end, it's a more equitable approach. So we hope to get there. But certainly that cost and cost shift, I think, has given policymakers pause. Political will, I don't think the political will's been there to see it through. I'm hoping that's gonna change. We've had more pressing priorities when the state puts a cap on property taxes and our ability to generate additional revenue and make improvements, when we have unfunded mandates come our way and we have to deliver services, that takes time and attention. And of course, we've had other political distractions in this community for a number of years now. And hopefully that's something of the past. So there are a number of reasons why we haven't taken action, but if you look at the history Again, on the first page there, you'll see that the City County Shared Services Committee in 2006 really said, all right, let's retackle this. We knew it was looked at in the 90s. Let's take another look at this opportunity. The City of Sheboygan passed a resolution in 2006 saying, let's have a feasibility study done. So the Common Council took action, say, all right, let's revisit this. That's fantastic. On the next page, you'll see the City County Shared Services Committee heard reports from surrounding counties. Those have already gone to combined dispatch, got experience from others. What's worked? What hasn't? How can we get it done here? As the chief said, all of them said, it's the right thing to do. And when you do it, make sure you don't do it on the cheap. Have adequate staff in place because we have lives at stake here. Let's do it right the first time. We heard that loud and clear. The sheriff had a feasibility study for combined dispatch in 06. That was shared with the Law Committee, with the City County Shared Services Committee. And in fact, in November of 06, they put together a subcommittee, a subcommittee made up of County Board, 
supervisors, county representatives, predominantly from law enforcement, city representatives, pr predominantly from law enforcement, and folks from the general public. In fact, in the audience today, I see Gary Maples. Gary Maples led the second ad hoc committee. I think you were involved with the first as well, were you not, Gary? He's nodding. He put a lot of time and energy into this to see if we could bring people together. Ultimately, that first combined dispatch study report in 07 presented several options. It was shared with the respective committees. Didn't go anywhere. In 07, the city county passed a resolution, took action, said that the Common Council approves the city county shared services subcommittee report recommendations. They liked what that ad hoc committee had put together. We want to create a new negotiation team to discuss this more and it is the intent of the count and, and in doing so they would like a joint communication center that the county pays for including the building costs and the personnel cost and to spread that across the county. Hindsight showed that was a non-starter. That wasn't going to get the job done. So the law committee reviewed that, reviewed the ad hoc committee report, the first one, and as you can see on the third page, there was a letter from the chairman at that time, Glenn Marcus, to the mayor that said the law committee was impressed with the subcommittee's report. There are a number of benefits of combining dispatch. However, ultimately, the law committee agreed that it wasn't worth pursuing in light of the Common Council's resolution at specific point that the county absorbed the full cost associated with this endeavor. So we had an experience. We tried something. Didn't work out. Died. The city Common Council, to its credit, came back in 2008 and said, let's, let's give this another shot. The current City of Sheboygan Emergency Dispatch Center remain in its current location at City Hall until a logical, fair, and complete shared services study takes place. And very shortly thereafter, in 08, they passed a resolution saying, we're going to rescind that 07 approach that the county run with it and pay for everything. Let's get back to the table and start a new negotiation process. And that one, Alderman Jim Gisha and Alderman Hannah presented a joint dispatch proposal with the committee, with, with the, uh, what was it, the City County Shared Services Committee, highlighting a plan to house a joint dispatch center at 833 Center Avenue, the building across from City Hall that was being vacated. Hey, maybe we can all get together in there. In fact, at that time, they offered to provide $2 million to ramp up that facility, and they offered the police department as a backup. That was the proposal. That proposal ultimately was discussed by the City Council and went to the City County Shared Services Committee. The City County Shared Services Co Committee asked Gary Maples if he would kindly step forward and chair an ad hoc committee to visit, revisit combined dispatch and the concept and would it make sense to have this at the facility across from City Hall. Ultimately, in December of 2008, on the bottom of page 5, you'll see that the Joint Dispatch Ad Hoc Study Committee final report to the City County Shared Services Committee was, the report indicates that after reviewing the cost to locate a countywide dispatch center at Center Avenue or at the LEC, our Law Enforcement Center, compared and contrasted that, that was part of the charge that the City County Shared Services Committee gave them, it was determined that it would be most cost and operationally effective at the Law Enforcement Center and that the city police department be the backup. That is what the ad hoc committee comprised of city representatives and county representatives and people in this community who care about this issue. That's what they came up with. And as it relates to financing, the report proposes that the city commit two million toward ramp up and support costs, provide one million backup dispatch facility at city PD and provide ongoing maintenance for the backup facility. That's a much sweeter offer than what was being considered a year earlier, isn't it? These are real dollars to help ramp up and transition to a combined dispatch center. What happened? Well, when it went to the law committee, there was discussion internally. Our finance director at the time, Tim Finch, had some reservations about the county absorbing that cost and what that means for our levy and distribution and whether or not we'll see a return on the investment. The Law Committee held a special committee meeting to consider it. The City County Shared Services Committee got together in January of 2009. Gary Maples presented a very professional overview 
for probably the fourth or fifth or sixth or I don't know how many times. He was relentless at sharing information and making sure it was factual and people were involved. And ultimately, the ad hoc, ad hoc committee's recommendation, what I just laid out to you, was supported by the City County Shared Services Committee on a vote of eight to two. All right, we've got something. We've got a proposal that has legs. Our City County Shared Services Committee combined of County Board Supervisors and City Common Council members. It's not 100% consensus, but we've got something. Well, what happened? There was concern with how we were going to deal with the cost. This is a big cost shift to the county. I mean, bottom line is, the county board has approved the concept at least two or three times. It's that almighty cost. How are we going to manage this situation and that allocation situation? As you can imagine, there are rural supervisors, some in the room tonight, who, if this ultimately goes forward, will see their constituents' taxes for combined dispatch double. If you're going to pass that kind of increase onto your constituents, you better have some pretty good rationale for it. I think you heard some pretty good rationale tonight, but if the public's not engaged, if they're really not that interested or concerned, any tax increase of any kind is generally not very welcome, is it? So this created, okay, what are we going to do with this? We've got a, a city-county shared services committee that supported this proposal. It's got some merit. The city's putting some real dollars in up front to help ramp up for this and for the county to take it over. It'll be in the law enforcement center. The police department will provide the backup. You know, okay, th this has got legs, but we thought, all right, how do we incrementally implement this? It doesn't happen overnight, and you sure as heck don't want to make mistakes when it comes to combined dispatch and emergency response. So... We put together a five-year plan. In 2009, again, the City County Shared Services Committee supported this January 12th of 2009. By the end of January of 2009, we thought, let's put together a five-year plan. So in 2009, we thought, let's get our memorandum of understanding. We're all on the same page. And the City County Shared Services is a segment of the overall council and county board. They're not the final decision makers. This is their recommendation. In 2010, we want to create a calm communication center manager, half-time supported, a full-time position, half supported by the city, half supported by the county, because both entities, as you heard earlier, our supervision isn't what it should be. All right, it sounds reasonable. 2011 through 2012, we're going to add some much-needed supervision. We're going to get our protocols in line. We're going to get our architect renderings, our plans in place, because that doesn't happen overnight. And then in 2013, we're going to remodel the law enforcement center. We had a plan. What happened? Well, if you turn to page 7, you'll see that consternation continues. Where is this going to go? How is this going to work? Ultimately, in March of 2009, the county board adopted a resolution supporting the concept of combined dispatch, a very common statement, and entering into negotiations with the city for this communication center dispatch manager. So I took that as, all right, let's get our memorandum of understanding and let's get at least our dispatch supervisor in place so we start incrementally working toward this. Not bad. The committee, City of Sheboygan uh, Grievances, Salaries and Grievance Committee, they recommended that the report from the county be accepted and, give a and gave a favorable recommendation to the Common Council. Sounds good. Let's get that MOA in place. Let's get that half-time dispatch manager in place. In fact, I know both units of government budgeted for that position. We're making progress. Very shortly after that, budget processes really got rolling. And to make a very long story short, ultimately those positions were pulled from both units of government's budget because of other priorities. We took a step back. The memorandum of understanding was never prepared or signed or agreed to. The five-year plan was put on the back burner. And as far as our records show, very little happened. In 2011, Chief Domogulski, to his credit, 
newer face to the community, certainly not aware of all the history, blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into this, wrote a letter to the City County Shared Services Committee, and he said, hey, why don't we have combined dispatch here? And I'll tell you what, let's have it over here at the police department. Putting out the olive branch, bless his heart. Well, we've been down that road, we've touched on that. Uh, that has not come with a lot of enthusiasm for being at the police department, and, I'll, and we'll all touch on that a little bit more in a few minutes, but discussions started getting renewed. All of the history seemed to kind of dissipate. We didn't even talk about the five-year plan. Super Alderman Hammond, to his credit, made a phone call. We got some discussions going. Um, it appeared that maybe we'd revisit it, maybe we're, we're starting from scratch, but essentially all that good work just seemed to kind of fade away, and we seemed to start over again. And people like myself and others go back and look at history and where were we and where have we been and what progress have we made. In February of 2012, the city of Sheboygan passed a resolution approving combining dispatch services between the city of Sheboygan and Sheboygan County. Once again, we have support for the concept. The city approves the recommendation of the City County Shared Services Committee to begin the process of implementing a combined dispatch center to be initially housed at the Sheboygan Police Department. Well, that's interesting. So we're going to initially go to the City Police Department and then, I guess, return to the Law Enforcement Center may have some merit maybe we can get this combined dispatch going more quickly but if as you can imagine all the time that it takes to ramp up and get that done we're gonna ramp up there we're gonna ramp up at the law enforcement center is that real practical the fire chief sent one of his and, and chief Herman I think has been so consistent about the importance of doing this and I compliment him for that and I appreciate that the Sheboygan County Board very shortly thereafter passed a resolution Approving county, administrator, approving county administered shared dispatch plan operating out of the law enforcement center. Very shortly after that, this group started meeting. And speaking for myself, my personal point of view, it's crystal clear that there's support for combined dispatch. Crystal clear. The concept has been supported time and time again. In my opinion, it's very clear that the, that the need's there. It's the right thing to do. We should be striving to get this done because it's the right thing to do for this community. So on, on that premise, how do we get there? What's always the biggest hang-up? Of course, it's the almighty dollar and an equitable cost allocation. My hope is we were past talking about how many dispatch dispatchers we need. For the love of Pete, we've been talking about that for a decade. The Sheriff's Department, if they run this, that's going to get figured out. And let me tell you, the county board isn't going to allow them to have any more staff than we can afford. Location. Well, where should it go? Speaking for myself, I was hope we were past that too. If the Sheriff's Department is going to run this operation, I think it makes absolute sense that it's in their house. Communication. How many times have we heard communication is the key? Well, if we need supervision, if the supervisors are right there in place, I guarantee you communication is going to be better. It's going to be quicker, it's going to be more efficient, and ultimately we're going to provide a better service. I'm not looking to save a few dollars here on the old communication front. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's put it in the house of the people that are operating it. So what we focused on the last six months is cost. And Terry is going to get into the key distinction between allocation and you know who really has the most to gain here. And again, with all due respect, from a cost standpoint, not a service standpoint, from a service standpoint, we all have something to gain here and we all should take ownership for it and want this to happen. But from a cost allocation standpoint, if you were a city taxpayer right now, you were paying so much more than a rural taxpayer for dispatch services. And when it comes to fire protection, emergency response, you name it, I'll tell you what, I want the best, most efficient response that we can provide. And I think everybody does. 
combined dispatch will help with that. So uh, what do we propose from a county standpoint? My direction and charge to uh, our internal team was, what is the most money that we can ask from the city common council for them to help ramp up or transition for the county to take this over that will still allow them to pass on a savings to their taxpayers. So initially, our first proposal in June was uh, to have the county take it over, run it out of the law enforcement se center, and we were asking for $5.7 million. Well, as you can imagine, when we shared that with some of these good folks from the city, jaws dropped. Everyone's struggling. Where are we going to come up with that? The thought was, $5.7 million will help with our ramping up costs, the remodeling, and there's a lot of equipment, radios, all sorts of things associated with the importance of emergency response dispatch services. $5.7 million also allowed, however, even bonding for that and paying for that each year, over a 10-year period, each year city taxpayers would still see a savings. And after 10 years, of course, it's a tremendous savings. But throughout that process, it was a saving. So I, my hope was, perhaps naively, was that, hmm, maybe common council members will hold their nose and support this because they know they're passing on a significant savings to their taxpayers, and ultimately it's a huge windfall. As for the county board, here's where I think the tough sell is. The rural county board supervisors, it's tough to look your constituents in the eye and say, I'm going to double what you're paying. But if they can look them in the eye and say, you're going to get all these improvements that you just heard today, all this is going to happen, and the city is going to really step up and provide a significant contribution for this transition to ramp up to allow to this to happen. I mean significant. My hope was that enough rural county board supervisors might be comfortable enough with that to say, all right, it's time for some give and take. We can support that. A couple of months into our process, we reduced that number from 5.7 million to 3 million. If 3 million was provided by the city for the county to ramp up, city taxpayers would save $222,000 per year. At the end of 10 years, we'll have saved 2.2 million. And after 10 years, we'll save $613,000 a year. They'll be paying significantly less for dispatch services. That's with the three million transition cost. What will that mean for, in fact, on an average $150,000 home, currently, those of you from the city, if that's your average $150,000 home, you're paying $75 each for dispatch services. If this occurs, you'd be paying $60 each, and after 10 years, $37 each. As for the county, rural uh, taxpayers right now, they're paying $17 currently, far less than the city. They would go up to 37 as well, so everyone would be paying the same. Significant reduction for city, significant increase for rural, but ultimately everyone's paying the same for the same important life-saving service. To put it in perspective, that's $3.13 a month to get law enforcement, fire department, search and rescue, ambulance services to your home or business as quickly as possible. $3.13 a month on an average $150,000 home. Whereas these same people are spending $600 annually or $50 per month just for fire insurance. In my opinion, when you put it in perspective, that's a pretty important first step to make sure the fire protection isn't as needed. So, of late, our committee was focusing predominantly on that proposal, that $3 million. I don't know if the county board as a whole will support that. I don't know if that's enough of a transition cost for rural supervisors to, to say, you know, I can hang my hat on this and, and I support the additional improvements. I don't know if common council members can support it because Boy, $3 is a lot of money. But I think if you look at the direct impact to the taxpayers involved, again, with all due respect, I think it's an easier decision for common council members to make than it is for rural county board supervisors to make. Now, during our discussions, though most of our focus was on this, 
Uh, the city, Jim Amodio, Don Hammond, shared the proposal from the Common Council around June or July, offering the, the city police department. Internally, at least from a county perspective, we kind of talked about it as a non-starter. You know, we've been there. We're not going to go to the city police department. But it is a proposal. It's an option. And I'll turn it over to Jim to talk about that. Thank you. I feel like uh, I'm on 60 minutes. We've got point counterpoint here. As you know, uh, I'm a pretty practical guy. Uh, I try to use common sense in my approach to most things. And from a city perspective, uh, we made a proposal that we thought, uh, from the city's, second, city's perspective, we thought we made a proposal that made a lot of sense and was the most cost effective. I think in the history that I put together was great, but you have to remember as well, the city really didn't have its own real police department until 2009. They were actually living out of the first floor in City Hall. So we really didn't have room to expand anywhere. <clears throat> the cost savings to the city uh, and the approach by the county is great in that it would save residents uh, $600,000 a year after we would pay $3 million of debt off. But if we just go back 20 years, and if we just pick a number of $500,000 that the city taxpayers have been overpaying, for this support, that's $20 million. And that's not going back to the beginning of time. So we have to put it in perspective. And the goal here is to get more people motivated about what costs are really in their tax base. The city has been paying 100% of its city dispatch and almost 30% of the county's dispatch costs forever. What we're trying to do is make that equitable. And we're trying to do it in the most cost-effective way. In February, the council passed uh, spending $356,000 on the city PD's facility to expand it, to make room for supervision and a manager, and to put another council in it, as well as to put fiber optics cable in between the uh, city hall and uh, the uh, city PD. That which has many benefits, I won't go into them, but it actually provides high-speed connectivity. It provides redundancy. It gets us off our microwave uh, net, which, it, which at times is not reliable. And it also provides backup for not only all the squads in the county, as well as the city, but fire protection as well. So when the city looks at it and says that we have an extremely viable facility, which is three years old, it can be expanded, and we talked about this for a long period of time, about how long we could live there before we had to bust the walls out. And it was probably past a lot of our lifetimes of people sitting in this audience. So it's pretty far out. And that was based on numbers of calls. So we have to be careful on looking at expanding and how much the county's going to grow in the next 15 or 20 years. Certainly, we'd have five consoles, which is better than, far better than we have today. One would be used for training and supervision overview. So the city's position is that we use the city PD. We would save $3 million of costs that would be allocated. We'd, we would be able to start combined dispatch at least two years earlier than the county is proposing. And we would finally allocate equitably the cost for combined dispatch to city and county residents. And that's what the city has laid out, and that's the proposal that we have on the table. It makes a lot of sense to me. It's probably the most cost effective uh, that we can provide. And as long as we have management, whether it's run by the city or county, that supervises the, the, the approach right now is one manager and four supervisors that would manage 21 to 24 dispatchers I believe you could put that most anywhere in the city and would be run effectively. The real key is the benefits you get from that center being combined. So where it sits, it's kind of turf war. Uh, we think we have a facility that we would maintain at no cost to the county, and it's the most cost-effective alternative.
All right, I'm going to walk through the county's or the current proposal that the county has forward um, in regards to the three million dollars that Adam referred to in his presentation. Um, I think we went through a lot of background, but essentially the background is, you know, both entities are looking towards the combined dispatch center, and we were looking at the opportunities for improvement. And the sheriff and, and Chief Herman, um, all right, all all gave the good presentation on why we want a joint dispatch service. Essentially, the proposal that the county put forward was that. The county will run and support a combined dispatch operations out of the, or, I'm on the wrong one here. Excuse me. Out of the law enforcement center. And the city would fund the remodeling of the law enforcement center, dispatch facility, and associated equipment costs in the amount of $3 million. We projected that the annual debt service for that investment would be $391,000 a year for 10 years at a rate of 2.5%. We thought that this would be a win-win under this proposal. The city taxpayers would be saving $222,000 per year while funding the debt, 10 years of debt service. And at the, at the end of the 10 years, $2.2 million will have been saved and $613,000 a year will be saved thereafter. Um, Sheboygan County as a whole would benefit based upon the improved communications that um, we went over in great detail earlier. In determining how much the city pays for their dispatch service, how much the city taxpayers pay for that, um, versus what county taxpayers are paying for dispatch service, I looked at the overall levy. And right now, we look at the city of Sheboygan is providing 27.6% of the tax dollars that the county collects in its property taxes. Um, I know there was a little bit of reference in regards to um, paying $20 million of additional money for duplication services, but if we just look at this pie chart for one second, the population of the county of the city is approximately 40% of the county. This is not 40% of what's being paid. In addition, a lot of the services that the county puts forward are um, used by a lot of urban center um, tax, or not taxpayers, but residents. So I think if we did a real cost analysis of what the county is spending, I would think that we would expect a bigger piece of the pie to come from the city, but that's not the tax structure that we're in. That is also not how this dispatch center was originally set up. So I don't think that we can go back and look at what's double taxation and what has happened in the past because that is the cards that we have been dealt with. I don't think that whatever we do now can rectify anything that anybody feels from the past as far as double taxation or if someone's contributed more or if the city's not contributing enough. I think the best approach is to look at what we can do forward and what looks equitable from this point on. So looking at this, um, we then used the tax levy that the county has for dispatch services, which is $992,000. The city has a total tax levy of $932,000 for their dispatch service. We applied the 27.6% to the county's portion to come up with $274,000 that the city taxpayers are paying to the county for dispatch services and then the city's portion they fund of course hundred percent of that so if you add those two numbers together the city taxpayers are paying 1.2 million dollars for dispatch services under the proposal the total tax levy for the dispatch services would be 2.1 million dollars and this might be a little bit low, this might be a little bit high. It all depends upon how we end up funding it in the long term. However, the percentages all stay the same. So the percent paid by the city taxpayers is 27.6%, and that equates to $593,000. Now, if we include the debt service for this facility and that transition funding that Adam talked about, we would be looking at a total of 
$391,000 for that debt service. Adding those two together, the city taxpayers would then be paying $984,000 a year for the, the joint, for the dispatch services. Now the annual savings during those first 10 years would be 222,000, so at the end of 10 years it'd be 2.2 million saved. Beyond that, we would have $613,000 that the taxpayers of the city would be saving per year. Now, how that looks, and Adam touched on this briefly, was if we looked at what an average equalized value of a home in the city, if it, it was $150,000, currently they're paying $74.52 per year for dispatch services. Under the county's proposal with the $3 million contribution, that would go to $60.80. So there would be a reduction of $13.72. But after year 10, that would go to 37.62. So that would be cutting the total amount that the city taxpayers pay by almost in half. Whereas under the county, we would be looking at 1736 is what they currently pay for dispatch services. Under the proposal, they would be paying $37.62. So that's a $20 a year increase. And that was part of the cost shift that we were mentioning earlier and allowing the broader county supervisors selling that to their constituents. So that was the desire to, as Adam put it, try to get the most that we could, but now we're looking at the $3 million mark. But the key factor to look on this is at the end, for the dispatch services, both city and county taxpayers would be paying the same amount for dispatch services. And looking forward, not looking at the past and not looking at the hard feelings and setting all that aside, I think when you look at it and say 10 years from now everybody's going to be paying the same for the same level of service, I think that's something that the community can say this is a definitely a win-win. Everybody's getting the fair piece for what services they're receiving. Looking at the equalized value for $1 million, that was just for business representation. So if there were businesses or higher end homes, we could see what that impact was. And we just did a little analogy that the $37.50 annually for the dispatch services equates to $3.13 per month, which is very minimal. And if we look at what fire insurance is for a home, about $150,000, we got a quote that it's about $600 annually, about $50 a month. So this improved communication can definitely help the taxpayers as far, if they're ever in that situation because you get that reduced service or reduced call time and it's only costing $3.13 per month compared to the $50 that you would pay for fire insurance. So we thought that this was a very equitable solution, one that both entities might not necessarily think this is a great deal but if both people can walk away and think in the long term this is going to be good, I think it's a viable solution. Thank you, Terry, and to all the presenters, and uh, appreciate your comments. Uh, the mayor and I uh, both uh, spoke earlier, and we'd like to open it up for questions. If everyone could try to be brief, we'll try to get to everyone. First, we'll try to uh, get the questions from the uh, city aldermen and the county supervisors, then open it up to the rest of the public. And the mayor is going to uh, walk around and uh, get, get the uh, speakers to... Uh, get, there, you got the first one right there. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Corey Raythor. I'm the alderman from District 1. Uh, I appreciate all of your work and everything that we did to uh, organize this meeting. Uh, one, one component I think that everybody's forgetting about that I think needs to be mentioned is um, the actual uh, employees and the dispatchers themselves who are going through this process as well and the stress that's been put on them. And when you look at this timeline starting in, in 1999, I kind of look at it as uh, a business has been bought out by another business and each uh, week or so the employees wake up and read the paper and find out whether or not people think they're staying or going or re relocating or what exactly the future is. And, and, and I guess my point to this or my comment is, is I'm looking for some resolution. 
and uh, hopefully a quick resolution. Uh, so I'm asking my fellow um, aldermen and uh, county board members to, to try to um, keep them in consideration when we're trying to uh, come to some resolu resolution excuse me, and uh, do so as quickly as we possibly can uh, because the stresses on these people um, are, is, is immense. And uh, whether it's the city or the county, I I'm sure that the, the resolution is what they're looking for so that we can uh, move on. And, and um, again, I'm not lobbying for one way or the other, but just some resolution. Thanks. Anybody else? Any county supervisors have a... The resolution that was passed towards the end of the last uh, county board term uh, called for the sheriff's department to to consider and, and go to the police department first. And as a county supervisor and past chairman, I was disappointed when that changed in the current negotiations. But I think we all have to realize that it changed and I don't think it's gonna go back. Uh, I think that the Sheriff's Department put a lot of thought into this and uh, they, they lo looked at everything, but uh, that's the direction things are going now. And I think we've gotta, gotta rally around that. The other thing that I want to bring up is, is, is elected officials for the last decade and a half, we've all been trained that we can't bond for too much money. Uh, we've had caps in the city for $3 million and caps on an annual basis for bonding of $4 million in the county. And I really think that because we've had those caps for the last decade to the decade and a half, we are in a position where we can bond for more than we, we have in the past interest rates that are an all-time low and I think this really fits the situation. Uh, the other thing that you have is you have our bond rating agencies who are, are uh, saying that it's not going to hurt your bond rating if you bond additionally to that three or four million and you also have the lowest interest rates that we're probably going to see in our lifetime to help us out with this move. Thank you. District 2. Anyone else? Mike, can you see me? Um, oh, Mike, Alderman Hammond. Oh, there you are. Thank you. I completely appreciate your comments about the bonding limits and um, where we're at with that. Um, the challenge, I think, when we look at $3 million, and if we were still housing the PD in City Hall, like Alderman Gisha and Alderman Hanna had proposed um, uh, early on, I would completely support that position. The challenge I have is we have a brand new or nearly brand new facility that would take $356,000 to ramp up and get into a position to um, be doing combined dispatch in a much quicker time. Um, I think there's a lot better uses if we're going to bond for $3 million um, inside the city of Sheboygan infrastructure, various other things that not only impact the city of Sheboygan but also, also benefit um, rural um, uh, citizens who work and play inside the city of Sheboygan. So, again, um, it's not that we can't. Um, it's, is that the best use for the money when we have a perfectly good facility um, in the city of Sh inside the city limits? Way back in the corner. Uh, Dick Bemis, uh, District 23 on the county board. Representing a rural area, I'm glad I don't own a farm because when we figure tax base, it's on all the land that's owned, not the $150,000 house. Any other city aldermen or county supervisors? I am John Bellinger, and I'm the uh, also served the first district um, council member. And um, I agree with Alderman Hammond and his point. And I find uh, uh, all the work that's been done. I want to commend both governmental bodies and the uh, 
the committee here. Um, very good information that was shared. But I have a very hard time representing the city and, again, trying to build something that already has just recently been built. We've got a structure that is brand new. Uh, we're willing to put, like Alderman Hammond said, $356,000 to ramp it up, get it quicker. And um, I just have a, uh, a real hard time with the logic of an argument saying that the management and supervision will be less effective if it was at the city versus if it was on county property. I think the effectiveness of the managers and the supervisors um, is going to be fine no matter where it is. And um, that, that's what I think. And I think that it would be a foolish waste of tax dollars to build something or, re or uh, remodel something when we've already got an existing structure that works out fine. I completely empathize with that point of view. And as we were discussing this early on, you know, we thought, well, let's go to the police department. Let's try that initially, as you know, was the wording, and then we'll come back to the sheriff's department. And I think that language was selected to appease everyone, those who wanted to go to the police department, those who want to see it ultimately at the sheriff's department. But with all due respect, and I, and I completely empathize with that point of view and what was just shared, I don't go to my next door neighbor when I need health advice on my children when they're sick. I talk to my wife, she's a registered nurse. If I have a roofing problem, I go to a roofer. And though I, again, completely appreciate the challenge here, I think if you're looking long term and focus on the savings to your constituents, this is a winner. Where I'm putting my hope and trust is in the law enforcement professionals that do this day in and day out. Though I appreciate and respect your opinion, and it probably could work at the police department, I'm going to put my faith and confidence in the law enforcement professionals that have to run it, and who are telling me how important communication is, and that seconds and minutes count, and that we need that supervision right there. Even under the proposal, we don't have 100% supervision all the time, whereas if they're in the same building, literally steps away, that's going to be beneficial to the overall oversight and logistics. The other comment on that is, we checked with all 72 other counties. No one else is doing it the way we're possibly considering, you know, running a county combined dispatch center out of a city police department. No one else is doing that in the state. I don't want to be the guinea pig when we're talking about a possible response to my family or my friends or the constituents in this community. I don't want, I don't want to take that risk. So again, with all due respect, because I recognize the challenges, we're all struggling with finances and this is a, it's a big investment. But right away you have immediate savings to city taxpayers and I'm going to put my I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to err on the side of what the law enforcement professionals are telling me that are responsible for this and do it every day. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> my name is Peggy Fighter, and I represent uh, District 18 uh, on the c county board. Uh, I also am privileged to chair the City County Shared Services Committee this year. Um, my comment has nothing to do uh, about where this facility is eventually housed. What it has to do is um, with the uh, notion that we as local politicians have a chance to take hold of a long-term view of our future uh, emergency uh, plans for our county. And in that vein, plan for its financial stability. To that end, um, I think that we need to build a plan that calls for cash reserves um, to avoid short-term borrowing on either the city or the county's part. Thank you.
Um, I just, I guess I if I don't cover what he's going to cover, he'll, he'll have an opportunity. I guess what I want to add when it comes to uh, the location and, and looking at 2012 uh, to get up and running, we're not going to make 2012. Just the logistics of hiring enough people, qualified and trained, to do the job of a dispatcher, we will not be ready. The reason being is, when we go combined, nationally wise statistics say there's a 20% turnover right off the get-go. 20%. Now we can only train so many people at one time. And then to let them on their own takes up to nine months, five months. Ah, that's what it was. Five months for training, and I let go just not too long ago, one individual, just, just a few months ago, I had to let an individual go that did not meet our standards. Now we're right back to having to start over with a whole new applicant, hopefully getting through training. So if we're talking about a 20% turnover, we're talking about a significant number of people that right now I know from our department, if we go combined and the anxiety that this is causing, I know of several dispatchers that will plan on retiring because they can't. The whole combined dispatch causes an awful lot of anxiety on both houses. It's just as the alderman Raceler had said. There's an awful lot of anxiety with these guys and gals that are doing the job wondering, are we going combined? Do I want to put myself through that? I can retire. I think that it's going to be tougher for the city dispatchers because they're not accustomed to Mavis. This is going to be a rude awakening for those dispatchers. I can see that it's going to be easier for the county dispatchers versus the city. Because the city has a, a, a great system in place to dispatch their fire department. We're talking about numerous volunteer fire departments, EM services throughout the county that have to use the Mavis system and it's going to take a while. And some are going to throw up their hands and say, you know what, I can retire. I'm going to go ahead and retire. So even the quick turnaround to use the facility of the Sheboygan Police Department, we won't be ready that quick anyway. If we're going to end up being responsible for it, I am going to request that we have more time to set ourselves up for success. And that would mean we can actually then prepare to have a facility within the LEC, and hopefully the timing works out that we do it as, as quickly as we can with the, the mindset that, hey, we're going to do this right, and we're going to do it as quickly as we can and prepare ourselves for success. Okay? And I think we can save the money up front from starting at the city because we're not going to have enough people. Because I, I know there are several people. If we pulled our people on each side of the house, I would venture a guess we're going to lose several people and we will be hurting from manpower. We just got ourselves up to almost full staff and it has taken us, what was it, six years? Almost five years to get fully staffed, to find qualified people. Now, the city's had some great success lately. We're recently getting some good success in getting qualified people. But boy, if we're talking about a mass exodus, we are also talking about having to have enough people to train, because you're going to burn out our trainers. We can only train so many at, at, at a time. So it's going to take time to get ourselves to uh, a staffing level that we, we can make it work. So. Uh, the other thing I guess I want to add is we're kind of viewing ourselves, I, I don't think we're viewing ourselves as one big community. We all reside in Sheboygan County. We are a large community. And I think we're seeing ourselves as individual communities yet. And I think it's time for us to start making some decisions, especially in this, uh, in this arena. There's a bullet coming down the road. And a prime example of this bullet, that's coming. It's heading our way. One example of that, and we, we dodged this one, and that was the Broadworth State Parade. Several years back, there was a, a pursuit that was cut off by the county, ended up in the city, and it was by the grace of God that nobody was killed. It was heads up police work, observation skills by officers working the parade that prevented a, 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 a tragedy. And that could have been prevented with this concept 
of my dispatch because that situational awareness would have been there. Those officers would have had that heads up and plenty of time to remove people from harm's way versus split second decision making. I think we need to start taking a look at this and making some decisions as a larger community. We all live in Sheboygan County. And we need to do what's in the best interest for the citizens of Sheboygan County, do it for the right reasons and the right way, and learn from the mistakes from other combined dispatch centers that have paved this way and followed their model. And I thought we've had put a lot of work and effort combined in taking into all that account of those previous efforts of combined dispatch and all the pain that went with it to our benefit. Um, apparently I didn't touch on what the inspector wants to talk about, so I'll turn it over. Thank you. Hi, I'm Inspector Bill Brookbauer. I've been with the county just over 31 years. A third of my career has been spent on and off working on combined dispatch. I can probably safely say that I probably have more time invested in this than anybody else in this room. I just want to touch on a couple of points really quickly. Adam Payne had talked about that no other county in the state has a county department or a city department running a dispatch center out of the other agency's jurisdictional headquarters. Not one. There's a reason for that. And it's logistical and it's operational. The main reason that we have for us is you've got to realize, we talk about adding dispatch supervision into our comm center. We're talking about four supervisors and a manager. That is not enough people to provide 24-7 supervisory coverage in that comm center. Roughly 20 to 25 percent of the time, there will be no supervisor. Currently in our houses we have now, our patrol supervisor provide that supervision. If we are, the county is running that dispatch center and it is housed at the city police department and it's at one of those times I don't have a supervisor working my, my patrol supervisor is down at the sheriff's department there is no supervisor in that comp center that's the first reason we all heard earlier that one of the main emphasis is one of the main strong points of doing this is we're going to get some supervision into our comp center we're actually taking a step backwards if we're putting it at the city and having the county run it because we're not going to be able to, to do that part of the time. We'll end up with none instead of having it all the time either dedicated or at least a patrol supervisor will be able to do that. Second, most of you don't realize but the county is responsible for issuing the vast majority of warrants and commitments within this county. Roughly 2,200 warrants or commitments are issued by our dispatchers in a year. All those warrants do under current regulations. They have to have a hard copy of that warrant in front of them when they enter it. You have to have a hard copy of that warrant in front of them when they cancel it. That means that those warrants that are now taken care of by our court officer who basically walks back and forth between the courthouse and the sheriff's department dozens of times a day just drops them off. It is not a logistical issue. If we move out to the city, all those warrants have to follow. We have to somehow get 2,200 warrants every year out there to enter them. If they get canceled, they have to get back. It's logistically very troublesome for us. Also, all those warrants have to be validated. That's another about 2,800 a year that they validate. We don't control that. Those warrants, we get a number from the state that says, you pull these warrants, you validate them, we have to do that. Those warrants, again, we have to have access to them for them to validate them. Logistically, which is why initially when this was brought forward, it was never intended to put this at the city and leave it at the city if the county was going to run it. Never. The initial plan was we could start at the city while we renovated at the county if we wanted to get it up and try to get it running a little bit sooner, and then we would move it. The original a resolution, there was an ordinance I can't remember that was passed by the county, states that. There was also some, uh, some slight additional beneficial cost savings because we could use some city, dis or city dispatchers currently while we were there, but as soon as we moved back to the county, we'd have to hire. So there was a short-term limited savings also. That's not going to go away. So the other thing, we talked about that they have a modern facility. It's, it's up to date and it's newer. That's correct. The facility is newer than ours. However, we just passed our, our five-year capital plan. We have to upgrade our entire radio system countywide. Every council in both houses are going to be brand new within two years. All the equipment will be replaced. It will all be brand new. The furniture will be there. But all the electronics that actually does the dispatch is all brand new, both houses. If we build it at the city or at the county, 
they only have five councils if they expand the city. If we remodel at the county, we will have six. That gives us two councils, basically, that we can use for training purposes, and we can immediately, in their situations where we need to have additional staffing or a larger dispatch presence, we can immediately increase our dispatch capability in our primary center by 50% without moving anywhere. We only have five at the city. Five is too much for, not too much, but it's going to be more than you really need for a backup center. If you build at the city, you don't have to remodel it. If you build at the county, you don't have to remodel at the city. You can leave it as it is. You don't have to spend a dime on remodeling or taking any additional office space away from the police department. You can stay as is for a backup center. So there are advantages for us to go at the LEC outside of just the, the cost and logistically to stay for, expect us to stay there for long term. It just, you're actually chipping away at the reason we're doing this. It's to give complete situational awareness to create a situation where we have good and consistent dis or dispatch supervision and create an effective and efficient, as best as we can possible, dispatch center. If we're putting it at the city but having us run it, you're chipping away at the very foundation of why you're doing it. And it's for $3 million. And I know $3 million sounds like a lot, but we're talking about an investment in something that's going to be servicing this county for decades. And it's larger, you're even going to prolong the time to have to expand to a longer time frame at the county because it's going to be a little larger than what you can build at the city currently. So you're even pushing the idea of when you have to expand it or remodel it or whatever, even farther out than you can at the city. So there are definite advantages to putting it at the LEC. And after much thought and looking at it, that's why we decided that if it's going to be run by the county, it should be started by us, built there, and we start there, we don't move. Conclude my comments. Anybody have any other questions? Good evening. My name is uh, Tom Epping, District 15, uh, Town of Plymouth. I'm on the county board, and I'm also a member of the law committee. Uh, we've been debating this, this issue for many, many years. And, and I, I look back, and Initially, I was not sold on the fact that combined dispatch is the way to go. I have, I have shifted my, my uh, ideas about that, and I would say combined dispatch is a good, viable, and important program to have. But I have some reservations in it. And let me start, <clears throat> and I'm going to be dovetailing on some of the things that Inspector Bruckler has said. Um, and, but, but what I want to also bring up is the fact is I think there are things that are not being mentioned that eventually will happen as a result of com uh, combined dispatch. There are programs uh, that I know that there's a lot of emergency medical systems want, and one of those programs is emergency medical dispatch. Now, this, I think, is a good program, but it's a very expensive program, and we're not really looking at the cost of this. Um, another issue that has been brought up a long time ago, and I'm going to dovetail again with uh, Inspector Buckbauer, and this was an issue that was brought up by Rock County many years ago when we went to them for advice on um, emergency medical dispatch, and they told us at that time, if you're going to do it, do it the right way. Do not cheapen it out. And the reason I bring that up is initially... It was told to us by Inspector Buckbauer and a lot of the people that, that uh, uh, were, were researching this that nine supervisors is needed for 24-7, 365 coverage. And eventually, I think, if we go into combined dispatch, eventually we are going to need that supervision. To implement this program, I think they've They've lowered the requirement uh, to, to get the program going, and I understand why they're doing that. But eventually, it's going to have to be done the correct way, and that is the advice that we've been given by other jurisdictions. Once we start this program, there's no going back also. In other words, we're not going to say, oh, we give up, we're going to go back to the old way. Once we start putting money into it, it can be like a sinkhole if we don't do it right. 
I'm convinced that that uh, that this would be a, a good program, but I'm also looking at some of the operational costs and processes that eventually will come come down that we're going to have to pay for. And I'm I'm approaching this in a cautious sense, knowing that that there's stuff that's coming up that I know that eventually the taxpayers are going to have to pay for. Um, and I think that pretty much uh, is, is some of the items here that I, I wanted to bring to your attention. But I want, I want to see it done and done right. If we're not going to do it right, let's not do it, because we've been given that advice from other places. Thank you very much for your time. Any other discussion from the alderman? Otherwise, from the general public, we have a few minutes left. Any questions from the uh, residents of the county or city? Please give your name. Dave Augustine, City of Sheboygan. I'm going to be talking from two points. I've also been had fun being on the committee, and there was a lot of hard work put in, a lot of good thought. A lot of up there, a lot of planning, a lot of debate, and the original plan that was put together was absolutely right. It was going to be housed at the city first for the short-term phase, where that would allow us to get our management staff, our standard operating procedures, we get the routines and process defined. After that, the longer term was to relocate it at the county which that's what we wanted originally. However, if we have it in a phased or planned approach, it can give us time to either, like Peggy was saying, we can budget funds to put at constructing that facility so it doesn't hurt so much when we do want to do it, you know, and then have it staffed. Because either way, if we want a backup center, we're going to have to do our testing back and forth. So that's how I'm going to talk about how that was. As a citizen, <coughs> um, Adam, you're absolutely right. You want to go to who you trust, you know, for what you're doing. Uh, the communication is important. However, as the staff, the management is there at, with the dispatch center, that communication will be there. Now, there is going to be some process changes or whatever, but my background is I've been in IT. Um, where I previously was, I was in healthcare. I managed data centers and all the infrastructure for three hospitals and multiple clinics. So I have places all over the place I had to manage. And you talk about life-threatening situations when a radiology machine doesn't work. You know, that's life and death as well. It got done. It's through your standard operating procedures. It's through your processes. You change to adapt. Okay. Um, it can be done, is all I'm saying. It's just kind of maybe a win-win to get to the win-win situation or for things to look at. You know, it's just a different twist, which I historically have been doing so as far as that goes. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to comment on the emergency medical dispatch issue that was brought up. Um, I don't think that should be confused with the combine, combined dispatch. Um, that's an important concept that probably should be in each dispatch center. Probably a little bit more important in the county dispatch because of the longer response times out, out into the county. But um, yes, there is an expense to it. Um, but I don't think it should be put into this argument. I think it's something that's needed in both centers right now or would be helpful in both centers. Whether it's coming down the road or not, yes, there is an expense to it, um, but I don't think it should be confused with this issue. In addition, when we spent a lot of our time uh, looking at the staffing levels, and I know it's been brought up, are there hidden costs or not? I would offer that I believe there are hidden efficiencies that we haven't looked at. We, we all looked at the numbers. Um, we've never had combined dispatch here. <clears throat> we've looked at our call volume. We've identified that there are times of the day, days of the week, when there is lower call volume. We don't know if we're going to need four dispatchers at all times. So I think if we do go to this, as we get down the, the road a year or so, there may be other efficiencies that are there to be gained. Anyone else? My name is Gary Maples. I'm a resident of Sheboygan Falls, and Adam was kind enough to mention my name a couple times before. 
Uh, I was in chair of uh, two subcommittees that look at combined dispatch over the last six years. Uh, it's, it's been a long journey, as was mentioned. The uh, first documented uh, study of combined dispatch that I'm aware of goes back to the early 1970s when the law enforcement center was being built, and at that time it was decided that there was no need for combined dispatch. So a, a missed opportunity. So 40 years have gone by, and uh, my one comment tonight is that 40 years from now, I will be 108 years old. And I don't want to be talking about combined dispatch or leading a subcommittee when I'm 108. Or the head of the committee, okay. Uh, just a, a couple things quickly. Uh, there are, I see this as being two significant issues. One is, one is the cost, whether you're talking two million or three million or four million or five million dollars. That's a big ticket number. That's not small change. But I want you to understand But what we learned from our studies was that is actually a bargain. The counties that started from scratch said, let's build a facility from the ground up, brand new, no, no new, no, not modernizing an existing building or rehabbing it, but start, they spent eight to $10 million to accomplish combined dispatch. When you look at it in that perspective, again, is $2 million or $3 million a significant amount? Absolutely categorically it is. But because of the things that have been done in the county and the city, you really are poised to do it at a relatively low cost compared to what others have experienced. So I, I recognize the city's position and say, but if somebody were to come to the city and say, we can save you $200,000 a month, excuse me, $200,000 a month, that would, be, that would be pretty good. Yeah, that would be take it. Okay. $200,000 a year, and then in 10 years, $600,000 a year. But you have to buy this $300, $3 million piece of equipment. Well, you might give that serious consideration. $200,000 return in the first year on a $3 million investment is a 7% return on investment. Where else can you get a 7% return on investment? So not, that's not too bad in this, in this economic climate. So one, one issue is, the, is I think the city needs to recognize that there is a cost of getting out of dispatch. And I don't know what the right number is. I don't know whether it's 500000 or $5 million, But I think it's fair to look at the city and say, to save money going forward in the future, there, there's a cost to accomplish that. The second issue is the cost to the rural resident. Uh, I, I cringed a little bit when Adam said that the cost to the rural resident was going to double. Yes, it's going to go from $17 a year to $34 a year. Now, if they were paying $200 a year now and it was going to $400 a year for dispatch, that's a different issue. But that boils down to $1.69 a month. I really don't want to see the county board hold this entire project hostage for $1.69 a month. That is so incredibly short-sighted. We have the opportunity to give the best level of dispatch and, and emergency response that we can to equalize it all the way across the board, but both parties are going to have going to have to give a little bit in the process. So please, don't make me come back when I'm 108. I'd really appreciate it. It's about 8 o'clock, the time we uh, said we'd be wrapping up, so we'll start wrapping up here. Uh, Bob Wallace, City Police. Uh, I just want to comment on one thing. I've started the, my comments this evening by saying that we fully support the concept of a joint dispatch, whether it's in the city police department uh, managed by the sheriff's department or in the sheriff's department managed by the sheriff's department. We believe that can work at either location. Um, with respect to whether or not that occurs anywhere else in the state, my understanding is that Eau Claire has been doing it for 30 years, uh, operating out of the dispatch out of their city police department. Some of the other things are operational issues, things like warrants, you know, some of those types of things are really getting ahead of ourselves. Um, if the if the two governmental bodies agree to work out the details and, and or to uh, go forward with joint dispatch operation, there's going to be a lot of time to work on protocols and policies and, and uh, uh, transition people to learn uh, the different jobs, whether they're, they're currently city dispatch personnel that would be going to a county uh, to a joint operation or, or the county personnel as well. We believe we can make those things work. There's going to be plenty of time to make transitions and to provide the proper training. Those employees are going to have to be provided proper protocols. And with respect to supervision, I'm convinced that no matter where it goes, 
that there's going to be proper supervision in that communication center. Um, they're going to have some dedicated supervisory staff, a dispatch manager, and if there's occasions where that has to be supplemented by supervisory police personnel, we'll make sure that happens. They're going to have people to go through to make that, uh, to get that direction and get that advice. So some of the operational things I would say, don't get hung up on those details. We've got a bigger question in front of us uh, uh, at the moment to, as far as commitment to, to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, for coming, for the good information we received. Are there any closing remarks from anyone else or not? Uh, then I'd like to uh, once again thank everyone. If I could have a, a motion from an executive committee member to adjourn the meeting, it would be in order. A motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>